Hi everyone and welcome to this latest episode for Species Reintroduction on the Biome Project with Roby and Emma and today we're going to be talking to you about the reintroduction of the Wolverine to Britain <laughs> or rather the potential reintroduction. <laughs> yeah I think we should say potential here there's a lot of um, yes. <laughs> controversy with this one. Well, I think it's there's not even a lot of controversy. It's just that no one's ever considered it because it's a little bit of a silly idea. But hey, we're going to talk about it anyway. <laughs> um, so the way this is going to work today, I'm going to do a quick overview of the Wolverine, um, bring out a little bit of paleontology. I'm sure there are some closet <laughs> paleontologists out there who enjoy it. I hope. Anyway. Um, um, there definitely are somewhere. <laughs> And then uh, Emma's going to talk to you a little bit about the biology of the wolverine, what its arctic adaptations are, its diet. And then we're going to discuss not the reintroduction because it's not happening. We're going to discuss the potential for reintroduction. Um, and we're going to come to a fairly obvious conclusion with the wolverine, <laughs> I think. <laughs> But then, like we said in a, a previous podcast, like we do welcome your ideas as well. So if you listen to this and passionately feel like we should bring the Wolverine back to the UK, <laughs> then feel free to like leave comments and, and let us know what you think. Yes, so, any passionate Wolverine we rewilders, <laughs> let's hear from you. <laughs> so do you want to start right with like, yeah, species overview of the Wolverine? Yes. So the Wolverine is also sometimes called the glutton. Uh, and it's I love Lat that. Yeah, and, <laughs> and its Latin name is Gulo Gulo, which is essentially Latin for glutton. Uh, although in some other places it's also called the Carcajo, the Skunk Bear, or the Quick Hatch, which are Ooh. fun names. Uh, so there are two subspecies: the American, which is Gulo Gulo Luscus, cool name, and the Eurasian, which is Gulo Gulo Gulo, which is also I my Latin. I really name. like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I, I can relate to that quite well. <laughs> So what is a wolverine? Because I'm sure we all think of Hugh Jackman. I do regularly. Uh, but he was actually inspired by a real animal. And you can see it on your screen now. This is a wolverine. So it's a mustelid, which is the same family as badgers, otters, weasels, all the things that me and Emma love best and spend far too much time trying to go and see. <laughs> um, we, we One day we will see all seven species one in the day. UK. We're, we're getting there. I think we've got three at the moment. Have we got three? I think we've got three. Um, beavers, otters. Beavers are rodents. <laughs> I didn't mean beavers. Badgers. <laughs> badgers, otters. Um, oh, maybe we've just got two. That's no, I swear we have more than two. That's but anyway. Anyway, so <laughs> it's the largest land-dwelling mustelid, and it's about the size of a medium dog. Uh, so about 20 to 40 inches long. So, you know, a pretty hefty animal. And it can weigh up to 25 kilograms. So it's a chonky boy. Um, wow, the glutton name is fits it well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is all muscle. And if you look at it, as you can see uh, on the screen now, it resembles a bear more than the kind of other mustelids like weasels they're all kind of long and thin um, it's quite strange looking no no offense yes. to the wolverine but like <laughs> its face kind of looks a bit pine martin-y in a way that's i'm getting that vibe from well, that wolverine interesting you say that because the closest relatives of the wolverine are the martins and the Terra of Latin America. Have you seen a Terra, Emma? You spend quite a bit of time I in Latin haven't, America. no, but I okay. looked one up before this and they are one of the weirdest looking. They look so out of proportion. I don't know if you agree, Ro, but it's like <laughs> you have an otter and you've stretched its legs and pulled out its ears. That's <laughs> how. <laughs> the Wolverine forms a group called Gulonini, which seems to have originated in the early Miocene of Spain way back in the day. Uh, with the genus Iberictus, which in turn gave rise to the late Miocene genus Plesiogulo, which was huge. Oh, this was leopard-sized. Cool um, and then finally the modern genus Gulo, which arose in the kind of Pliopice-Pliocene border. So they've been around for a while. Uh, the point that we need to latch on to is that they did used to live in the UK. Now they live in northern Eurasia and Alaska, Canada. They've got the circumpolar distribution, a bit like the reindeer in a previous episode we discussed. Um, but they did used to live in the UK and it's thought they went extinct between 8,000 and 6,000 years ago um, due to hunting. Interestingly, and I really am speaking to any lurking wolverine fans out there, if anyone's got any more information on the extinction of the wolverine, we'd love to hear it. So in when we were researching this podcast, all we ever found was a date of 8,000 years ago, 
thought to be due to hunting. And we, we have no um, more knowledge than that. There's very little study done on wolverines in the British Isles historically. So if you've got any information, if you're a secret wolverine fan, <laughs> let us know. Um, so that's kind of what the wolverine is and where it is, I guess. Um, but what about its biology? What about its natural history? Yeah, so it's quite unusual in its um, sort of its biology. It has lots of adaptations in terms of where it lives and its habitat. So like you mentioned, it has that circumpolar range. So sort of has large numbers in Canada, Alaska, northern Eurasia. And its main habitat that it lives in is what's called boreal forests. Um, and also subarctic and alpine tundra. So you think of these areas, they're, they're quite cold. They can experience some very <laughs> harsh weather conditions. Um, and they have adaptations to this. So they have really, like you saw in the picture that we showed you, this really, really dark, oily fur, which is hydrophobic, um, mm. which interestingly makes it resistant to frost because oh, hydrophobic cool. obviously means kind of water repelling and because the fur's dark, it's absorbing a lot of heat. Um, so that's why it's able to to trap a lot of heat in its oh, that's body. That's quite cool. Um, and one super cool thing, which <laughs> I didn't know about this until we were researching it, um, but they have a really interesting adaptation in their mouth. So with their teeth. Ooh, tell um, me about the teeth of the wolverine. <laughs> I love, I live for this stuff. The teeth, I thought we have done quite a lot on the teeth stuff at uni and how you can tell so much um from the dentition of animals um so what they have is this special kind of upper molar that's in the back of their mouth okay and it's rotated 90 degrees to allow it to rip meat off carcasses that have been frozen solid Oh my god, that's crazy. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> like, that just shows you how kind of well adapted they are to this yeah. very harsh environment. Well, you've got these frozen <laughs> carcasses and they're still able to kind I love of, it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously, when we think of the wolverine, and it's, you know, its whole Latin name is glutton. So eating is presumably what it does best. It's, I can relate very strongly to this, <laughs> to this animal. Um, so... It's primarily a scavenger, so it feeds on carrion, which is your dead things that have already died. Probably didn't need a classification. Oh, definition of carrion: <laughs> dead things that have already died. We're paying nine grand a year for university education. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have needed to classify the things that died are dead. Anyway, dead <laughs> carcasses, um, and they often follow larger sort of carnivores predators things like mm. wolf and lynx and they'll actually scavenge off their kills oh that's cool um so you think you think of these big predators like wolves wolverine are, i would still pursue the wolf and try and take um oh, wow. its kill so they're quite um kind of they're a voracious and they, um, they kind feeding of eat, style they kind of i've got it in my head that they kind of eat anything is that right Yes, I mean, the <laughs> list is quite extensive of things they eat. I'm going to oh, read give, give us the list, come on. <laughs> Go, we love, we love a <laughs> cheeky list. Um, so they can eat, they'd usually take things like small, medium mammals, which is obviously a big list. So things <laughs> like porcupines, squirrels, chipmunks, beavers, marmots, moles, gophers. What, what are gophers? I think they're like little ground squirrel things. I think. I think that's North America, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then keep going with the okay. list. Rabbits, voles, um, mice, rats, shrews, lemmings, caribou, roe deer, um, white-tailed deer, mule deer, sheep, goats, cattle, bison, moose, elk, martins, mink, foxes, lynx, weasels, coyote, and wolf pups. <laughs> so that was, I think that was 23 I think. I'm really bad at counting on my fingers. Anyway, that's, we're not going to stay on that. <laughs> so that is, I mean, a very, very long list. And you would have noticed on that list, quite varied. Mm. So it's not just the small mammals that they're taking, even mm. though that probably is a large part of mm. their diet. Um, they will also challenge and take on things like we mentioned wolf pups or lynx and things wow. like that. So things that are bigger than, well, not bigger, but 
as equally kind of a predator yeah. level as them. And I guess the small um, things like voles and mice and rats would probably a pre- be a predation event, whereas something like a bison, I imagine, would be scavenging. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I heard apparently there was one one incidence of a wolverine taking on a full-grown moose and killing it. Uh, but wow. apparently the wolverine also got stepped on and died shortly <laughs> after. So... Um, a very wide diet, but they do pick and choose their battles, I think. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think it just shows you how, like we mentioned with the teeth adaptation, like they're able to feed off these giant, possibly like a bison, like a giant frozen carcass, mm. which has been killed by something else, but they're not afraid to mm. to challenge other predators as well. Um, so they actually have quite interesting what's called intra-guild relationships. Um, so that's kind of sort of like, how would you describe that, Roby? Like what I, that is? I guess like a guild would be um, a group of niches in the same area. So uh, carnivores would be a guild. And so intra-guild relationships would be the relationships between carnivores. And I guess like um, uh, avian intra-guild relationships would be the relationships between <laughs> bird species I think a a guild is like a group of things which do similar things, I think. Yeah, no, I think that that describes it well. So we're talking about sort of made kind of carnivore groups that are interacting with each other here. So say you have things like wolves, they'll be kind of one of their natural predators. So they'll predate upon wolverines. And often when you have wolves coming into an area that causes wolverines to to leave and kind of abandon um, the area. So there is that kind of pressure forcing yeah. the wolverine out. So they know they're um, not top... I was about to say top dog. No, the wolf is the top dog. They know they're not top mustelid. <laughs> in, a, in a way, but also they will confront other other carnivores. So they have often had confrontations with things like puma, lynx, black and brown bears. And most of the time, like you mentioned, when they try to take on something really big, they, <laughs> they lose. Um, but there have been cases where Wolverine have driven off and even killed these larger animals. So they're quite kind of... Fero- they, they can be ferocious predators as well as scavengers, yeah. I think is the point to make. And I, I guess... I guess I mean, I'm just imagining this Wolverine taking on a grizzly bear. Um, but one thing to mention is that a lot of the studies of uh, Wolverine's intra-guild relationships with other carnivores come from, you know trapper's tails way out in the middle of the Siberian wilderness so it's quite hard to confirm them but there is one anecdotal report of a wolverine killing an adult polar bear um and it's from a it's from like a a book which was written I think at the turn of the 19th century so do not quote me (laughs) on that but there (laughs) is someone somewhere apparently saw a wolverine kill an adult polar bear so yeah, they're pretty ferocious, and I, I assume that's where the the X Men superhero gets his his name from. Yeah, I feel like they drew on a lot of those kind of more ferocious characteristics yeah. in mm. that regard. I've never actually seen the human Wolverine. Um, but... It's Hugh Jackman, and he's got scissors in his hands or something like that. It's, it's blades, not I prefer, scissors. I think I prefer the real Wolverine. I feel like we're gonna get comments <laughs> saying, "Oh my god, they they don't know about the X Men." <laughs> <laughs> So obviously we probably, maybe that's maybe scared a few people um, <laughs> as to how um, vicious they can be. What would you say to their chances of being reintroduced in the UK, Roby? Slim. <laughs> nice one. Um, so theoretically, you know, an adult wolverine could survive and indeed be, you know, quite well suited to, you know, the upland bits of Britain, stuff like the Cairngorms, places like that. Um but there are quite a few issues I have with reintroducing the Wolverine. Like we're not we're not addressing a current issue. No one is is trying to introduce it now, so we're not criticizing anyone. <laughs> we just kind of thought, okay, well, what went extinct in Britain? What could you bring back? And the Wolverine is the one which you, we did go extinct. You could bring back. Um, I don't think it's a very good idea, however. <laughs> um, so, in theory, it could survive in parts of Scotland, but its preferred habitat, as we know, is boreal forest. You you see it on the Attenborough programmes, this vast belt of snowy trees going all the way around the pole, which at the moment doesn't exist in Scotland. So there are a lot of reforestation programmes happening in Scotland. Maybe if they reached a greater extent, you might have enough habitat. Um, But again... But they need quite large areas, don't they, They do, they do. And territory is another 
issue here. So the range of a male wolverine can be more than 620 kilometers squared. With wow, non that is very extensive. Yeah, female ranges within that. Um, and, you know, radio tracking shows that they can range over 100 of miles in a few months. And I just don't know if we've got the space. Um, I know I hate using that argument because people bring it up with wolves and lynx and stuff and bison, which we, we do. Um, but with the wolverine, just because they live at such low densities and they're such wandering animals, you know, maybe there's enough room for a few individuals. But a viable breeding population? I, I don't think so. Um, and there was a lovely yeah, study. I agree. There was a lovely study by people called uh, Gervaisi, 2019. I don't think it was Ricky Gervais, but Gervaisi. <laughs> some, anyway. And they, lo- <laughs> they looked at uh, um, uh, transboundary wolverine populations on Sweden and Norway. So they looked at what happens mm. when a population straddles a boundary. And they found that because of differing management and control in both countries, wolverine populations in that area actually had a 33% reduction over a period of years. And we know these animals range so far. So, yeah, if you've got 10 in the Cairngorms, what if one of them crossed the English border or, you know, came out of the National Park? Um, and I guess the issue there is that different areas would have different management strategies. So if exactly. it was, say, I mean, we seem to put everything in the Cairngorms that we say for the least. <laughs> um, but say if it was in the Cairngorms and there was a management strategy and it was all controlled, if it then did get down into England, I feel like it would be all havoc, break loose and yeah, yes. and, would not go well. <laughs> and the reason for this is it would probably kill a lot of sheep. Um Lynx get a reputation for killing a lot of sheep, but we know that based on evidence that can be A, easily mitigated, and B, it's not a significant proportion of sheep that are killed. Yeah. Wolverines, I'm sad to say, <laughs> uh, probably don't have that defence. Um, they're very vor- they're very voracious predators, and unlike the lynx, which sticks to dense forest, uh, wolverines roam in open areas, and sheep are very much in their size range of prey. <laughs> Um, right yes <laughs> yes so uh, there was a study by strand uh 2019 which investigated norwegian management strategies for livestock um with carnivals in the area so norway have a three-tier system uh they haven't yet bumped up to tier four or tier five as we have but maybe <laughs> they will um sorry maybe I, they I, should. Should, I shouldn't get political political <laughs> anyway um so they've got infield areas where the livestock is intensively grazed all year outfield areas where livestock is only released to rummage in the summer and then a carnivore management zone around it uh where carnivores is it is this fenced no No. Uh, okay and it's not a sanctuary either carnivores can be hunted uh in that area if they become problems um and in the carnivore management area there are actually target numbers of litters for each carnivore species um and so having this three-tiered approach where no carnivores in the infield area Carnivores do occasionally come in an outfield and then carnival management zone where they can roam all year round. It works-ish. You know, it's a reasonable <laughs> strategy. It main- sh- maintains sheep grazing as a viable industry in Norway. But farmers do suffer from it. Um, so, yeah, again, it's just another thing in the nail of the Wolverine reintroduction coffin, really. I'm not entirely sure... I mean, yeah, you know. I feel like even in a place like that, if it has its has its issues, and mm. obviously something like that would have to be so carefully managed. Mm. Um, I mean, especially, I'm not entirely sure how the management works, but if there are no fences, it's kind of like, well, what's stopping yeah. them taking some sheep or livestock from the inner areas? I, feel, I fear that could happen. Exactly. And if, you know, there's still a debate around the links, we're definitely not ready for the wolverine. Um <laughs> And so there are two no, other kind no. of yeah. There are two <laughs> other points about the Wolverine reintroduction, uh, like two other kind of shortfalls which I re- noticed. So uh, Barsugli in twenty twenty investigated snow cover. So when they mm-hmm. reproduce, female wolverines burrow into the snow in February and raise the babies in in the snow den until mid May. So this wow, okay, that's yeah. really late snow cover. Exactly, exactly. And so this limits wolverine habitat to areas with very late spring melt. Uh, Scotland may not retain enough of this late snow melt areas to maintain any breeding females. Um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm just dumping this on Scotland, but um, <laughs> there, there's no no possibility of a habitat in England. Um, I mean, even like in the Cairngorms, it wouldn't retain, I don't yeah. think, snow deep enough to yeah. dig like dens into until May. That's that's very, very late in the season. Um, and so Barsugli tw- 2020 were investigating this in North America uh, and it found that half of lowland den sites were going to be threatened by 2050. So this doesn't bode well for Scotland, I don't think. <laughs> so that, that would also be linked to climate change, I'm assuming, with a yeah. warming climate. It- yeah. Yeah. Nowhere is likely to have <laughs> as as extensive snow cover as it did in the past. Yeah. And uh the other study which is very interesting. Again, these are all largely North American studies because no one is looking at this in the UK. No one. And that's <laughs> fine by me. Um but we just thought, you know, we'd break it down for you. Uh so the lovelyly named Sawaya 2019. Uh Ooh. lovely cool name, isn't it? Yeah, Investigated I love the, name. Uh, the impact of roads and sex-based dispersal on wolverines um so is there a difference then between males and females and how they disperse well a bit like as we as we spoke about with the brown bears there does seem to be males disperse further and females uh tend to stay around their natal areas um and so they investigated the impact of the trans canada highway which i assume is a big highway in canada (laughs) Yes, it sounds big. Yeah. I've never been to Canada, but... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe tra- transiting Canada? Anyway. Um, and they found that uh, sexed bias dispersal across this road led to weak population structure in males uh, and genetic isolation and demographic isolation along sex lines. So you'd have a, a group of males, a group of females, and they wouldn't uh, cross over. Um, right. And, you know, most of Britain is crisscrossed by roads. So, and I feel like there isn't much in the way of. I mean, I know some countries are better in terms of they have like sort of grassed mm. overpasses where animals could, or underpasses even. Um, I think in parts of Europe where there's mm. links, they do have the tunnels which go underneath roads, but the UK doesn't really have that for anything at the moment. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, yeah. My kind of conclusion is as much as I would love to see wolverines in the UK, and I would. It's a it's it's a silly idea, but I we hope you enjoyed uh, learning about it. Uh, maybe you didn't realise that we used to have wolverines in the UK. So drum roll, <laughs> Emma. <laughs> I'm going to make the laptop move if I do it on the table. <laughs> what score on the reintroduction feasibility chart will you give the wolverine? Probably going to be my lowest one so far Ooh. because. Like we said, this was more of a, we wanted to raise awareness about what used to be here in the UK because we have lost a lot of our our wildlife. But I'm going to give it um, probably a three. (laughs) (laughs) Because I think, like for all the reasons we've mentioned, they are very kind of ferocious predators as well as scavengers. They would take large numbers of skeep. Of skeep? Sheep. (laughs) What is a skeep? (laughs) I wonder if they'll take large numbers of free-roaming haggis as well. Uh, I meant sheep. <laughs> and um, <laughs> like, say, with Norway, things like that, we don't currently have any compensation schemes, really, for any big carnivals because we don't have, have any. any. <laughs> y- yeah. So I don't think... And and with all the habitat suitability, there just, I don't think, is enough s- snow cover or enough vast expanses of land where they could travel. Um, but what about you? Are you going to go as low as three? I was going to give it a four, but at the end of the day, I think we've both come to the conclusion, probably not going to have wolverines for a while. And, you know, all the same reasons as you. Not enough habitat, not enough reproductive habitat. And, you know, they kind of just eat a load of sheep. Um, and <laughs> yeah, they're maybe not very well suited to yeah. our farming um, driven UK mm. Yeah. Um, society. And also, you know, they need space. They need all of Russia to roam about in. And we, we can't offer them that. And so I don't think we should try and bring them back when we can't give them what they need to survive, um, regardless of whether they suit us. I think if we can't provide for them, you know, we probably shouldn't bring them back. Uh, but yes, we hope you've enjoyed maybe a little more lighthearted um, <laughs> episode where we discuss the Wolverine. Uh, but again, if any of you are Wolverine, you know, nerds deep down and we'd love it if you were 
and you know more about the Wolverines in Britain, please do comment and let us know because we found very little. <laughs> I think that's the thing because it's not something that people have realistically considered mm. um, for the reasons we've mentioned. It's yeah, it's not something that's really been looked at, so there's very little sort of evidence on this. But um, yeah, we we hope you enjoyed it, even if it was the outcome is that we're probably not never going to have Wolverines <laughs> here in the UK. But um, yeah, if you want more updates about podcasts, documentaries, things that we're doing, you can follow the Grizzly channel on YouTube. You can search for the Biome podcast. And then we also post stuff on um, Instagram as well. So we are Biome by Grizzly on there. And if you want to check us out on Instagram, we also post stuff and go on cool wildlife tangents sometimes. And ev- eventually we will get <laughs> all seven species of UK mustelid. We're at two so far, but if you want to... You know, watch our search for all the mustelids. Uh, we we've will got plenty, get them. <laughs> plenty of badger and otter footage on our Instagrams that we've managed to go out and shoot. So shoot with a camera, not with a gun. Oh my god. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we we are Emma Hodson Wildlife and Roby Watkinson Wildlife on Instagram. So thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this bit more lighthearted, maybe less serious reintroduction <laughs> video. Um, but thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.